Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search. I'm your host, Casey Haston, an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. Today, as usual, I have brought you another fabulous guest. So I'd like to introduce Keith Walters, managing principal at Walters Development Group. Keith is on a quest to build great companies and to raise the bar of business, turning ideas into vision and vision into results. His 30 years of experience in leading, advising, and growing successful businesses makes him an expert on management and company culture, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today for sure. His success is based upon strong leadership capabilities and his ability to build strong leaders around him. Keith. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Casey. I'm glad to be here. You know I have been so excited about this. This is great. The day we first met. Yes. And I was kind of, I like to tell people the connection with my guest, and I'm I'm not going to lie, I was kind of stalking you. Fun. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) Well, you and I met through um, your podcast that you do. Right. Women Your Mother Warned You About. (laughs) Women Your Mother Warned You About, which Casey fits. I I think so, too. Yeah. (laughs) But I think that, you know, I think it's so interesting that you chose this platform, Women Your Mother Warned You About. Mm -hmm. So I'm going off script a little bit. Tell me why. Well, um, uh, for a number of reasons. One is the the primary person in, in the podcast, Gina Tramarco, is someone I had known and mentored for a while. She had a different podcast called The Pivotal Leader, mm-hmm. and we had met through The Pivotal Leader. And so I was mentoring her, and she came up with this idea. And the second is it's just a, it's an interesting topic for me. I mean, it's I love uh, looking at the challenges that people face, and this is a current challenge. You know, mm-hmm. women in business, and you know what what's going on, and and I have my own views on it, and so it kind of gave me a platform to uh, push some of those views or talk about them. And I think <laughs> that you definitely have a platform because I think most of the rogue topics that y'all do, you bring up. Uh, typically, that's the case, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, and I know there was one episode, and we're not going to talk about it because it's not appropriate for my audience. But. Yeah, our our uh, podcast is a little raw, a little irreverent, and probably something you don't want uh, on in the car no. when your children are in the car. <laughs> for sure. But that one episode, even Gina, who is so big and so bold and so fearless, she was like, I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. No. You know what I mean? That was like most of the conversation. And just finally, Rachel, Rachel Pitts, who is her co-host. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, She was just like, oh, no, this is happening. Yes. And I was like, whoa. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) So it's a lot of fun. You guys. Thank you for talking about it. Of course. Of course. And I mean, I, you know, I don't miss an episode. I may not listen to it the day it releases, but by Friday, I've heard it. Wow, I love it. Thank you. I, I'm the president of your fan club. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, there so you gotta go. I have to be on top <laughs> of it. So I met Gina Tramarco, and then I, little by little, she started introducing me to her world, and she finally helped me get to you. Wow. <laughs> How's that for an introduction? <laughs> that's great. That's, that's probably the best one I've had. <laughs> well, let's get into what, okay. why you're really here, and let's okay. talk a little bit about company culture. But when it comes to succeeding in a business, the best team wins. Right? Absolutely. It's that simple. And you've told us before, right talent equals right team. Mm -hmm. We totally agree with that. But how important is the culture fit in this process? So I think it's probably the most critical element of it. And I'm a big believer in the best team wins. And the best team isn't just about individual talent. It's about the concept of team. And the team has to be built around something. And so and so in business the team gets built around many things like the product, but a lot of it's around the purpose and the core value of the organization or the core values of the organization and then that trickles into the culture. Um so culture's huge in creating winning winning teams. I, I agree. And we were talking about this. I had the partners, my mm-hmm. partners for VIP on because I thought it was finally time that they got to tell their story. And we have a very entrepreneurial culture. Mm-hmm. And not everybody 
fits into that culture because, I mean, if you're not self-disciplined, if you're not able to grind it out on your own because nobody there is going to make you do it, right? it's probably not going to be a good solution it's, for you. But that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're not a culture fit. That's exactly right. That's so. exactly right. You know, and every, every organization has a culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's different kinds of culture. There really is no best culture. There's a culture that fits for what the organization is wanting to do. And, you know, truly the, 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 the organizational culture matches the, the top. Oh, for so, sure, top down. Uh, it's top down. So, um, but I think, you know, one of the most powerful things about culture in an organization is realizing there is one, that it influences things, and then recognizing what it is, and then influencing it if you, if you don't really want it a certain way or if you do want it a certain way. Absolutely. No, I think that's key. And one of the things that we've kind of seen over the years is that the culture has changed, mm -hmm. just like you're talking oh, yeah. about. And there were those who resisted the change mm -hmm. and ended up, you know, not getting on board with the change and basically self-selected out. Right. And right. that's... It's, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's yeah. what needed to happen. Right. I mean, you weren't happy with this change, so... Be happy. Right, right. So. so, did the culture change on purpose? Was yes. it done? Okay. Yes. Yeah, which is when it's done purposefully, I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We rebranded, and along with that rebranding, we had a little bit of a culture shift. And, mm -hmm. and it was, it's really phenomenal. And I will tell you so, and not just to talk about our culture, but I think that we have one that's very forward thinking. I mean, hello, we have a podcast. Right. You know, but there's so many other things that we're doing that show that we're just open to all those ideas. Like there is no idea that's you, you right. can't go talk to the partners about. Right. They may not say yes, but they might say yes. Right, right. So. And and that's a great strong culture, but yeah. you, you know, one of the things I when I talk about culture is, you know, not every culture has to be a soft, warm, feeling, you know, uh, you know, pool table, ping pong, you know, all this, you know, one, one of the, there, there's an organization in, in the United States that has an incredibly strong culture. It's an incredibly winning culture. People die to get into the, uh, to the organization and they don't play ping pong or pinball. And literally when I say they die to get in the organization, they die to get in the organization. The Navy SEALs has one of the strongest cultures oh. in any organization. There are no pool tables. People die trying to get in. There's a huge line to get in. It, it, uh, conversations are not um, two-way. Right. <laughs> um, they are mostly one-way. That's not completely true in the teams. But, you know, it's strong culture isn't about all the trappings, and it's not necessarily always – empathetic or mm -hmm. embracing or whatever but it is uh, and if we talk about the navy seals it is a purposeful culture it is in a certain way because there's a purpose for the organization and they foster a certain culture mm -hmm. to get the purpose done I, you are so right i never thought yeah. about it that way but have you read uh, jocko willick's book dichotomy of leadership uh no i i don't believe i've read that one it would speak right to your heart okay so okay. i would go I read that. And he was a navy seal okay yeah so it's a really good one. So what are three keys to a healthy company culture that every decision maker should be working towards? Well, I think the number one thing is that it's purposeful. Okay. So um, that, that you approach it with purpose. You don't just let it happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is determine what it is you want it to be and make sure it matches you know, who you are as a leader of a company. Yep. Um, you know, one of the most uh, profound examples of the, of the opposite of this is and now I'll show my age a little bit, but years ago there was a company called Enron, and you probably remember Enron. <laughs> and Can I stop you real quick? <laughs> yeah. So right after Enron, there was WorldCom. Yes. I had the guy that discovered the fraud for WorldCom okay. on the podcast. So yes. Yeah. Please. So, you know, th this is a co these were companies that had core values of integrity and, mm -hmm. you know, openness and these kind of things, but, but they weren't the values of the leaders. And so they, they were just markers on the wall. They weren't really the true core values of the organization. And the core values are kind of one of the basis of culture. And, um, you know, and then the third thing is once you, once you decide what it, what it is you want to be, you know, and the purpose for it, it's what are you doing on a daily basis? Uh, yeah. And and oftentimes I see organizations where um, the idea of culture it becomes the um, uh, becomes the accountability of the HR department, 
and I know HR department is a big client base for you, but culture is not the responsibility or the accountability of the HR department. See, it, it is goes to the top. It's the CEO, the COO, mm -hmm. the C-suite, the leadership team, and it's their responsibility. It can't be delegated. Exactly. Yeah. Because people are going to see that, and if you're always in your office with the door closed, right. that's what they're going to see. Yes. That's the culture. That's the culture. That you're exhibiting. Yeah. Yes. So what are some, um, okay, so let's say here I am, I have my little culture, and mm -hmm. I'm hiring people. What are some questions I can ask to make sure they're a good fit for the culture? That's a, that's actually a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, or, and, is this going to take up the rest of the podcast? And, yeah, I'd say it will. And I, and I brought along an old example. So <laughs> oh. um, most culture is based upon core values. And, um, you know, most companies who are, who are going down the culture path have a purpose and they have core values. Um and we talk about interviewing. How do you interview for uh, uh, people? You know, for example, I, I'm I, in my companies. Um, it is the interview process is culture first. You can be an you may need an incredible programmer, and you may be an incredible programmer, but you don't fit the culture. This place isn't for you. So it's the first hurdle for any interview in any company I run um, is do you fit the culture. Once we know that there's a culture fit, then we can talk about do you fit the needs of the job and so forth. So it's kind of this idea, the right person, the right people into the team. So hey, how do you know if someone's a culture fit? And there's a there's a old technique. It's been in the HR. You're familiar with it. It's called behavioral interviewing. Um, the interesting part about behavioral interviewing is have you defined the behaviors that you want to see? Because it's yeah. really interesting to try to uh, do behavioral interviewing if you don't know what behaviors you're looking for. And the challenge with core values is they're very subjective. Like one of Facebook's core values is be bold. Well, you know, it would be really bold of me to come up to you in the middle of the day and ask you something completely inappropriate. That would be bold. I was thinking slap me, <laughs> but that's so, bold too. But, but so bold can mean a lot of things. It's very subjective. Right. What are the specific behaviors that go along with being okay. bold? Where are the boundaries on being bold? And if you're doing behavioral interviewing, what behaviors are you interviewing for? So one of the things that, that I work, we, I've done in my companies, I work with other companies on in this kind of light is, and, I, and I'll pop out an example here, okay. and I've got a number, um, but I'll pop out one from a former company of mine. This is a former uh, company uh, we sold a few years ago called Axiometrics. We had five core values, passion, accuracy, commitment, tenacity, and transparency. But even that first one, passion, you know, it's like, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, so, so what we did, these core values, then we sat down and we asked the question, what behaviors best reflect these core values and lead us to our success? Mm. And we came up with 30. Oh, wow. So for those of you that are just listening on iTunes. Yeah, so there's a little card here. It's got 30 behaviors written on it. And, and these, just blew it up. these uh, behaviors became the more detailed description okay. of what we expected from a behavioral perspective. We could do things like if, if you were my supervisor and I wasn't performing really well, mm -hmm. you could call me in. I, I expected this from my supervisors. You'd call me in and say, okay, we're going to talk about number three, number seven, and number 21. Nice. This is because these are the challenges we're seeing right now. So, so we define specific behaviors, and then we interview for these behaviors. Right. So that's and you teach your, do you equip your people on how to do that interview? Yes, for because because standard behavioral interviewing I don't think is uh, valid today, and the reason being is because there's so much information available on the internet and so many ways to prepare. Standard behavioral interviewing would go like, Casey, tell me about a situation where. Mm. Yes. So. That that doesn't really work because you know what I'm a pretty good actor. I can remember a script and I can make up. I've got I've got this story prepared and, with all the I've details Googled you that. need. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so really, for me, behavioral interviewing is how do you be? How, what behaviors do I see in you during the interview? Okay. So yeah, we teach different things. Uh, one of our core behaviors was accuracy. One of the things that you would see me doing an interview is, let's say you graduated from Colorado State. And I'm looking at your resume, and I'm going to say, well, Casey, it's really cool. You graduated from University of Colorado. I love the school. It's kind of good. And, you know, and then I'm going to go on, and I'm going to see what you're going to do. One of our core values was accuracy. 
if you didn't interrupt me and correct me on the school you came from, you weren't going to go any further. Wow. Because accuracy wasn't important enough to you. And we had one other behavior, and it was one of my favorite. It's, it's, it was uh, number 14, and I'll read it to you. It says, give and foster pushback. It says, give permission and encourage pushback. If what is asked for does not make sense, does not fit our core values, or is not optimal, push back. Take positions that may pose conflict if necessary to reach the best results. Say what you think, even if it's controversial. Have a backbone. Well, if you didn't push back on me, you just failed that behavioral test. Wow. So those, that's, it's, it takes some work. Yeah. And, and, you know, having the best team wins. And so preparing whoever is interviewing your people, uh, your potential people, needs to be very well prepared um, for the interview and not just, hey, can you do an interview? Right. You know, they need to be really schooled well if building a strong team is important to you. So how and what did that process look like for you to teach your supervisors how to hire using that behavioral Well, question? the first thing is really institutionalizing this into the culture. We okay. th This is actually something that was uh, appropriated from different companies, but you know, um, uh, Ritz Carlton is a great does something like this. They oh, have really? they, Ritz Carlton has twelve gold standards every day at every Ritz Carlton everywhere in the world at every shift change. They go over the gold standard of the day and talk about it every day, every person CEO down. Wow. And so we we do we, in my organizations what I like to do is do that once a once a week and we have a behavior of the week and we would just talk about it throughout the week and then have our company huddle and we talk about it all meetings start with a little one or two minute discussion of it it's written everywhere next week it's the next one when you're through with the 30 you start all over so it becomes institutionalized and everybody's familiar with it then building questions around it is and teaching the how to interview for it becomes much easier. I love that. I, I, I'm used to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome to. <laughs> so, and let's talk about axiometrics. Okay. I mean, because obviously that worked. Because you and um, I think Ron, the, Ron mm -hmm. built that up mm -hmm. from. Tell, tell that story just real quick. Oh yeah, um, Ron, my, my uh, the founder of Axiometrics, uh, Ron Johns, he created a wonderful company. Um, I. Uh, joined him um, as an advisor for a while, and then I came in as chief operating officer. And we built a really fast growth, fun company. It was the best place to work in Dallas for a number of years. We sold it a few years ago um, to a publicly traded company. And, um, it, you know, and the, 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 the company or the brand and everything lives on. But um, it, was, it was a wonderful time. It was a lot of, it was challenge. But, you know, I, I can view it in my time frame that I was there and in the five years that I was um, there full time um, we grew from 23 to about 175 people um, over That's a five year period with about 40 to 50 percent compound annual growth on revenue so it was it was a fast pace and the only reason we did is because of every single person on that team That's I yeah it was nothing I did it was just the people that were there but they loved being there. They, so it was they fun. Produced, it right? was fun. They, it was fun. They they loved being there, and love comes with, uh, you know, some upsides and downsides. Well, <laughs> but um, it was it was a uh, it was a it was a great place to be. How much? What percentage do you think culture played in that successful growth? That fast growth. Oh, it was. You know. What's the old Peter Drucker or culture eat strategy for breakfast? <laughs> it was it was eighty percent maybe. Wow. Yeah. It was so key to that's, that's huge. to the success. Yeah. That is really yeah. huge. Yeah. And the reason being is because we took full advantage in a positive way to, to think about that, of all the talent that was inside that door. And everybody. It wasn't me or Ron or, you know, some of the other leaders. It was everybody was contributing so much to the to the company. That is awesome. That is just a great story. Oh, it's, it's I love, love that. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, what steps can a company take to nurture their company culture and keep employees engaged? And I think you kind of answered that partially by just saying right. going over your core values yeah. all the time. But is there something else we can do? Yeah, I think um, if you haven't read it, and I, uh, I can't think of the the exact title right now, but I'm a big Patrick Lencioni fan. Oh yeah. 
And, you know, Patrick uh, always writes his books, it seems like, in the negative tone, like five dysfunctions of a team. And by the way, that book is required reading for anybody that works for me. Um, That's an awesome book. Um, but one of the books he wrote was about employee engagement. Okay. And he says there's really three reasons for employee disengagement. And they are anonymity, mm-hmm. not being known. Yep. Ir- irrelevance, not knowing their relevance to the organization and immeasurement, Mm -hmm. no objective measures of what they're doing. And then if you can take care of those three things, that's a really good start. So how do you, you know, from a cultural perspective, how do you do that? And, you know, irrelevance is, is I think a fairly easy one to address, but you know, if a company's has val- has goals and departments have goals and so forth. I love the idea of you know frequent huddles, especially at the company level and the department level, mm-hmm. and keeping everybody apprised and getting everybody engaged and opportunities um, for for n- the opposite of anonymity being known. So you know, one thing we do, and I don't know that this would work in like a huge company, but we do uh, team lunches every Friday. Mm-hmm. And it's not that it's a required event, but nobody wants to miss yeah. it. Yeah. One of the one of the things we did, and I actually stole this from um, Big Ass Fans, if you're familiar with the the company Big Ass Fans. Oh, yes, I am. The huge yeah, fans. Yeah, yeah. And, and I told uh, the guy who uh, was founder, uh, it's based in Louisville, Kentucky, and the guy who's founder, his title was CBA, Chief Big Ass. <laughs> and um, he 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 had he did this and we we took it. So every Tuesday night, Ron and myself would take eight employees out to dinner. And we all, um, and luckily I had a wonderful admin. Lauren made sure that we had a mix of new people and people who had been there for a while and people from different departments. And we would go out to dinner every, it got a little old for me and Ron, but every Tuesday night we'd have a group go out to dinner and we'd learn so much about people. We had standard questions, but we tried to make it informal. And it created this cross-pollination, um, which I think is a key to a great culture. I- I think so too. And I think we also do, and kind of going towards seeing if somebody's a good fit for your Mm -hmm. culture, we do a culture lunch before we hire. Yes. And that's when people really show their colors. I'm a big believer, especially in supervisory level positions and up that have having an inter an inter a social interview is key. Yeah. I've learned so much about people when, when oh we're gonna hire somebody for a high level position and we go out to dinner and they treat the wait staff like crap. Ooh. It's like, mm, no, that's exactly. not going to fly. Because you're going to treat your people that <laughs> you're way. You're going to treat your people that yeah, way. Yeah, for sure, for sure. There, uh, that made me think of something else that I wanted to tell you about that, but I forgot what it was, so we'll come back to <laughs> okay. it. Okay. So let's go back to the interview process. Okay. And, you know, it's a two-way street, and it's just mm-hmm. as important for candidates to be interviewing the company to learn more about them. Um, how can a job seeker ask questions to help them determine if a company is a good fit for them? Okay. Can I take a roundabout way you to can, answer that you question? Can that. You can answer that. You can answer totally so different So I, I think, I think, it's an, I think mm-hmm. that's, a, that's probably one of the best questions to ask. And one of the things, you know, um, after we were purchased, um, you know, uh, people started deciding if they were going to do something different or not. And I remember a conversation I had with one of the young ladies that worked for me, and she said, when I'm interviewing, interviewing how do I find out? what the company is like. And I think that's so key. And I, I was really impressed. It's not how do I find out what the job is like. It's how do I find out what the company is like. And um, I've had this conversation with a lot of people. And uh, I, one of the things I tell them, there was, a, there was an article in Forbes magazine back in 2014, and the title was How to Build a excellent pitch deck if you're pitching your company to investors like you're going to pitch your company to an investor so what what do you need to present to them and it really made me think um if you're going into interview you need to act like an investor because you are you're investing your most valuable asset your time into this organization so the questions an investor want to have wants to have answered are things like um, what's your product? What problem is it addressing? What's the, what solution is it creating? What, uh, um, what's the business model? What's the marketing approach? Uh, who's the competition? What's the differentiation? And if, if, if you're interviewing with me and you're asking me those questions, either I can answer those questions and if I can answer those questions, 
that probably tells you the company's open. Yep. Um, sharing what's going on, or you can't answer the questions, and you might not be able to answer the questions for two reasons. One is you have no idea because mm -hmm. it's not shared. In other words, you're irrelevant to the company. <laughs> or you don't care. And the number one reason people leave a company is because, not because of the company, it's because of their manager. Yes. So if, if I, you know, one of the things I recommend to people is ask these questions like an investor. You know, you're going to have your other questions up front, but sometime in this process, especially if you, like, I may do this, go through this process. If the person you're interviewing with can't answer these kind of questions in a very telling way, in, in a very informative way, rather, it's very telling. You know, a comment back from an interviewer such as, I don't know, that's above my pay grade. Ooh. It's like, okay. <laughs> so that tells you something right there about the company and its culture. It's hierarchical. It's top down. It's bureaucratic. That may be what you like. And so that's a good thing to know because that may be a good fit for you. But that's really kind of what, how do you measure aspects of the company that way? So, I'll, really you know, good. pretend like you're an investor. Because you are. That the, and I love how you said that you're investing your, your most time. valuable asset, yeah. your time. And it's yeah. limited. It's it non-renewable. It is. That's, you know, the only thing about that's not, you know, scalable, you know, right, right is your own time. So. Exactly. So that's, that's precious. Right. Um, and so what are some of the other things that a job seeker should take notice of when applying and interviewing that help indicate the company's culture? For example, their level of professionalism in emails or the attire at the office. Sometimes you don't want to come to our office on call day because... <laughs> yeah. No, those are good points. Yeah. Um, you know, you need, you need to find an environment that aligns with you. Um, there, so, um, can't be too specific here to give it away, but, um, you know, in a former company, one of my clients was um, Frito-Lay. And there was an, ex an executive there... Sorry. Uh, there was an executive there who was, was looking to make a change and just for... Great reasons, and he ended up um, going to Southwest Airlines. Both Frito Lay and Southwest Airlines have great cultures. Mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines, you know, is always written up on their culture. Yep. Well, he didn't stay there very long because he didn't fit that culture. And he ended up going somewhere else, and he's done a great job. He's, you know, but just, you know, Southwest Airlines is a great culture, but not everybody fits every culture. So Absolutely. knowing what it is you're looking for. You know, one thing that I see, and this is mm -hmm. a little off topic, but how long was he at Frito Lay? Can you divulge that? Was oh, it like a, a number a of years. Of a number of years. Yeah, I, I don't re really recall. Okay. Um, as an outside person, I wasn't really aware. So one thing that I've noticed in the recruiting world, because you know, I look at hundreds and hundreds of resumes, probably mm -hmm. not a day, but I guarantee you a week. And I've noticed that somebody that has extended tenure at a company, mm -hmm. they're going to have one to two hops after that company when they leave because it's culture shock. Yes. Yeah. It is. No matter where you go, the culture exactly. is going to be different and getting used to that difference. But, you know, you ask about measurement. Um, I think, you know, what you see in the emails or the communication methodology um, says a lot about a company. I truly believe that there is an energy that you can feel of culture in a company. Um, in, in the companies I work with today, uh, I advise a number of companies. Um, and my former company, other companies, I knew that different feelings when you walked in the door. Mm -hmm. You know, one it was really common in my, it, it, we talked about axiometrics in that particular company. It was really common for external guests. I heard repeatedly when they walked in, wow, this place really feels interesting. And there's mm. so much science behind that. Yes. The, yeah. You know, certain emotions and mm -hmm. feelings, they cause different vibrations. And it's been measured. I'm not yeah. going woo-woo. Well, and, and maybe it is woo-woo. I don't know. But you can measure, you can feel it, you yeah. know. So, well, <laughs> um, and I, I can walk into places and, and um, you know, I feel oppressed when I walk yes. in. And other places, you know, can feel like it's like just energy of got to get things done right now, right now. And, you know, you can kind of feel some of these mm -hmm. things. So making sure that you visit the site is really a, a key part of that interview process. Oh, yeah, because a lot of companies nowadays are doing interviews off site. Right. And you're yeah. not getting to see your office where you're going to work until day one. Right. Right. And that's, I think that's a horrible mistake. Right. Yeah. So. Well, you want to visit where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 
Sometimes we work with clients that are struggling with their culture, Mm -hmm. and it can be hard to find candidates that want to interview. This is not even a joke, um, because they may have overheard the culture about the culture of a friend or read reviews on Glassdoor. What steps can a company take to move their culture in the right direction and let people know? So, um, really great question. Um, I, I work with this a lot. What steps they can take is, is first saying, wow, we must have a challenge. And it's really interesting. Glassdoor, um, there's prob- there's, there's a, I'm sure one of, my for- one of my former economists could tell me the answer to this, but there's a, there's a number of people responding to a question that kind of gives it statistical significance. Mm-hmm. But most of the scores on Glassdoor are accurate. You think? I do believe. Yeah. See, I, I'm going to disagree with you. Yeah. Because I, and, you know, and I've asked many, many companies that I've gone into about this, you know, what, like, I can tell you if I go read, like, in my last company, mm-hmm. if I read a Glassdoor review, mm-hmm. I could tell you who that person was mm-hmm. and why they were no longer with us. Mm-hmm. And it was usually, I mean, there's probably guilt on both parts, but usually it was the other person. Mm-hmm. Now, myself, who was completely, totally happy there, mm-hmm. never once wrote a review on Glassdoor. And so I think that's why those numbers get skewed. They can get skewed. I think, um, actually, um, if you ask, you know, one of the things I advise uh, my clients, the C-suite and companies, is promote Glassdoor within your company. Yes. And promote everybody to give a review. Everybody. And you know what? You're going to get some bad reviews. Big deal. Yep. Um, constantly promote the use of Glassdoor. I don't believe in trying to skin Glassdoor with your company. I don't believe in trying to respond to all the uh, replies. It looks like you're trying to manage the image if you do. I want to see raw. And if you promote transparency and openness, you're going to get positives and negatives. Yep. And you're going to learn so much more. Absolutely. Yeah. We've actually started doing that within our yeah. company. Is yeah. asking, you know, not on the same day, but, you know, just if we've done something that you're happy with, mm-hmm. Let the world yep. know because mm-hmm. we we're, we're we're still hiring like crazy. We've doubled our uh, employees. Mm-hmm. Um, we've doubled our employees and revenue over the last yep. two years, and so we have grown quite a bit. And we've we, we've got to hire more people. And the reality is, if somebody's coming in to interview with your company, they are looking your company up on Glassdoor. Oh, for sure. It's the reality. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, they are. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to stop. This has been so much fun. <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> I've already got the warning. That was <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I am going to ask you our VIP okay. questions. Yeah. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people <laughs> would you take with you? So I would, I would, uh, Gina take, no, uh, Just kidding. <laughs> I, I would take, um, someone of the opposite sex who I am highly compatible with. Okay. <laughs> um, I Should would we give a shout out or no, 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 okay. I can't. <laughs> um, I would, um, you know, I'd take, a, something like a long-term powered Kindle with every book I could cram on it and so many different topics. And I'd probably take my toothbrush and toothpaste. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> not taking any chances there. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> that's important because there's not going to be a dentist up there. That's true. Yeah. yeah so awesome. Yeah. Um, what's one thing you do to start your day to set you up for success? So, um, yeah, I have a whole routine I go through. But um, I actually do a, a core exercises every day. The very first thing I do when I get up, and it used right now my bedroom has hardwood floors. My former bedroom had carpet on it, I wouldn't even stand up. Um, I would I just roll, you, over, like, roll, out of bed. roll out of bed onto the floor and do the exercises. But it's every day, and um, it's about 30 to 40 minutes of exercises, and it's actually meditation for me. So okay. I, I, I like doing it most in the dark when it's quiet, and it's a form of meditation for me. I love to meditate. I yeah. think that's so, so important yeah. to get your mind right for the day. Right. So that's good. I, like, I don't exercise, but... <laughs> Okay, we all have. Yeah, routine. we all. It's, it's you know, it's whatever whatever works for you. Under the bright. <laughs> yeah, which is I wish I had more time to write, and I could if I didn't exercise. Exactly. But, uh, you give, that, it's give one or the other. Yeah. All right. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? It's what I use to introduce myself. I build great companies. 
and you do build great companies. Yeah. How do people reach you if they want to get in touch with you? Well, the easiest way is probably through my LinkedIn. Okay. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Keith Walters, okay. and just connect with me that way. And if you come through this podcast, let me know. I would, exactly. I was yeah. going to say, if you do connect with him, make sure you send a note with your connection that said you heard him right here on the We Are VIP podcast, okay? Um, Keith, I just oh, like... Oh, this is fun, Casey. Yeah. Thrilled yeah. that you said yes when I asked you to come on the show. <laughs> Even though I stalked I you, you didn't run away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have one more thing to say to you. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> you are a VIP. Well, thank you, Casey. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.